December 5, 1933. Newly elected President Franklin D. Roosevelt lives up to his campaign promise and brings prohibition to an end in the United States. In Boston, the city's hottest night spots are celebrating the Latin Quarter, Steubens, the Mayfair. But the hottest of them all is the Coconut Grove. In less than a decade, however, the celebration will come to a tragic end, when Boston's most popular nightclub becomes hotter than anyone could ever imagine. November 28, 1942. 41,000 college football fans jam into Boston's Fenway Park to watch the out-of-town Holy Cross Crusaders take on their arch rivals, the Boston College Eagles. Don Gribbins and his friend Tommy Sheehan have come in from Worcester to cheer for their hometown team, the Crusaders. Don has just recently become a firefighter. I decided that uh, I wanted something a little different and I took the examination for the uh, Worcester Fire Department. So I got appointed in November 4th of 1942. Boston College is the four to one favorite and is so sure to win that a victory party has already been arranged at the city's most famous nightclub, the Coconut Grove. 17-year-old Pauline Brooks is dating the captain of the Eagles football team. She looks forward to seeing the Coconut Grove for the first time. And I had gotten permission from my father to go, and I'd always wanted to see what it was like inside. My father was very strict in bringing us up, and I was not 18, so he had to agree. The victory party is premature. Holy Cross surprises everyone by outplaying the Eagles right from the opening kickoff. The Holy Cross created the biggest upset in the history of athletics by defeating BC, a score of 55 to 12, and spoiling Boston College's chance of going to the uh, Orange Bowl. In no mood to celebrate, someone from Boston College telephones the Coconut Grove to cancel their reservations. Holy Cross fans are more than eager to take their place. After the game, we heard a lot of the crowd was going to the Coconut Grove. So Don and I, after a while, we got something to eat, and we hired a cab, and we went to the Coconut Grove. A fixture of Boston since 1927, the Coconut Grove has seen quite a few changes since the repeal of Prohibition nine years earlier. Owner Barney Wolanski has converted the basement into the Melody Lounge, an intimate, dimly lit piano bar, decorated to look like an island paradise, with artificial paper mache palms and sky blue fabric draped just below the ceiling. Less than two weeks before the football final, Wolanski opens the new Broadway Lounge on the main floor of the building next door. Customers enter the main floor of the Coconut Grove through a single revolving door at the club's front entrance, which leads them into the foyer, the caricature bar, and the large dining room. Stairs to the left of the revolving door take patrons downstairs to the Melody Lounge. The new Broadway Lounge has its own entrance off a small vestibule at the east end of the building. A narrow hallway leads from the lounge to the main dining room. Several patrons in the main dining room have already recognized Hollywood cowboy star Buck Jones sitting on the VIP terrace. He's in Boston on the last leg of a cross-country war bond drive. By 10 p.m., staff can hardly maneuver through the crowded dining room. Head waiter Frank Balzarini begins redirecting customers to the new Broadway lounge around the corner. Among them are a young Coast Guardsman named Clifford Johnson and the two football fans, Don Gribbins and Tommy Sheehan. 
So we met the, the group from Worcester and we tried to get into uh, where they were seated, seated with the Millerly Lounge. And uh, we could, there was no room there. Designed for 100 customers, there are at least twice that many inside the Melody Lounge. The only access to the basement is the narrow set of stairs to the left of the club foyer. In the corner of the Melody Lounge, Iria Finn celebrates her 21st birthday with friends. We went there about 9.30 and we went into the Melody Lounge and I, we sat directly under the palm tree where it all started. She watches as a young man at the next table loosens the light bulb above him, casting the area in darkness. 16-year-old busboy Stanley Tomaszewski also notices and alerts one of the bartenders. It is 10 minutes after 10. He uh, was told by the bartender to go over and re-screw in a light bulb that had been uh, unscrewed by a patron who wanted a little, little more privacy for uh, uh, his time with his girlfriend. The light bulb happened to be in one of the coconut husks that was in the, uh, on the palm tree. At first he couldn't find the bulb, so he lit a match and uh, held it up about 10 inches now below the palm tree, saw the, saw the coconut husk there with a little seven and a half watt light bulb on it. Blew the match out, tightened the bulb, stepped down, put the match on the floor, stepped on it and left. As the busboy returns to the bar, customers around the palm tree catch a glimpse of orange flame in the paper leaves above. As flames shoot down the wood trunk, staff tries to pull the tree away from the ceiling fabric, but it is too late. Fire explodes across the ceiling with astounding speed, hungrily devouring the decorative cloth. Frantic customers stampede to the only exit they know, the narrow stairs to the main floor. Many try to escape through an emergency exit at the top of the stairs, but the door is bolted shut. Behind them, People push forward, but there is nowhere to go. Upstairs, in the main dining room, customers wait for the floor show to begin. Their attention is drawn to a commotion in the foyer. It sounds like someone shouting fight, but when a cloud of black smoke pours through the archway, they realize that the word is fire. A blast of flame bolts across the cloth-covered ceiling. Many customers die where they sit, burned by searing flames or smothered by hot smoke. Customers and staff rush to a set of double emergency doors at the back of the club. Just as they discover that the doors are locked shut, the lights go out. And all of a sudden, the place is in pitch darkness. Even if they knew that there was a door somewhere, there was no indication of it. Ravenous for more oxygen, the fire rushes down the corridor leading from the dining room to the new Broadway lounge. 17-year-old singer Dottie Miles is just about to begin her set. And the singer was taking the request for a song that we asked her to play the uh, Holy Cross Victory song. And uh, it wasn't very shortly after that that, uh, that uh, we heard this uh, uh, tipping over of tables and, uh, and uh, uh, screaming and hollering. And all of a sudden, we could smell smoke. The next thing we knew, on the right-hand side of the bar, a big blast of flame come out through the wall. And everybody got excited and started to jump out of their tables and seats. There was just mass confusion. There was no, uh, no heroics there. It was everybody for themselves. November 28th, 1942. At approximately 10.15 p.m., the Boston City Fire Department receives a call about a fire in the entertainment district. Charles Kenny Sr. is part of a company of firefighters who extinguish a small blaze in a parked car near the Coconut Grove. They are about to return to base when they hear screams coming from a block away. Nearby, 
Detective Elmer Brooks and his partner are parked near a police call box. And they were just sort of talking, and they were talking actually about the BC Holy Cross game. There was a flashing light on the call box near them. So he called it and they said, Brooks, it's Coconut Grove, it's on fire. When my father and his partner got there, they, the father said it was like Dante's Inferno, it was a scene out of hell. And uh, my father thought that I was there. Outside the club's front entrance, firefighters watch helplessly as the drama unfolds on the other side of the glass revolving door. They told me of what actions they took, and the tail end of every interview ended with the same comment. They said, geez, Charlie, if only we could have gotten in there. The revolving door, jammed under pressure, is held fast by the growing pile of charred bodies as the panicked crowd continues to push forward. That was a mob scene, everybody heading for the revolving doors. So I hung on to the coattails of this fellow, Dale, well, I'll follow him and he'll pull me through here. And he elbowed me as if to say, look, everybody for themselves here. Still inside the Broadway lounge, Don Gribbins uses his firefighter training to try and save himself and his friend, Tommy Sheehan. To always lay as close to the floor as you can, because that's where, if there's any air in the room at all, you're gonna find them that close to the floor. And I said, Tommy, let's go you know, towards that room. Somewhere along the line, Tommy got, got lost in the, uh, lost in the shuffle. And it started to get black. Everybody stood screaming. You could hear the women screaming all over, the men yelling, let's get to the door, let's get to the door. So I, I proceeded along the floor until I got to a point where I could see that the, the, the door was, because the bodies were piled up there probably five or six feet. In their struggle to get out, customers have been able to force open the door to the vestibule, at least for the moment. It is all Don Gribbins needs. I got a sit up quick, took a lunge, and I got over the bodies and I fell out into the street. Gribbins grabs an axe from a nearby fire truck and with the help of a passing pedestrian, begins to smash through a glass block window. Once we got one loose, we allowed some air to get in there. And those who were at the door or near the door, they had any life left in them at all, went for that opening. Inside, Tommy Sheehan feels his face blister as black smoke swirls around him. Something hits the back of his head and he goes down. In the main dining room, customers and staff manage to break open the double doors at the back of the club. Some are able to rush into the street as fresh oxygen rushes in. The flames, drawn by the promise of fresh air, hit the exit with an explosive blast. Firefighter Charles Kenny tries to help. My dad went down Shawmut Street, and when he hit that uh, double door, people were trying to pour out of it. And as he stepped in, uh, what he beheld uh, was a pile of humanity about five feet high, six feet high, uh, 50, 60, 70 bodies, and uh, some alive, some already dead. Head waiter Frank Balzarini is pulled to safety, but goes back in to supervise the evacuation. He did his level best to, uh, to uh, get as many people out as possible and, uh, and did succeed in saving a number of people. And he just kept going back in until uh, he got overcome himself and died in the Police detective Elmer Brooks helps firefighters at the front entrance. And then he was trying to help pull bodies out from the revolving door because they were just stacked up like cordwood there. They, the door was jammed and the arms and legs would come off in his hands at times. He was constantly looking at faces because he kept praying that I wasn't there. You know, he kept thinking, my God, please don't let her be there. It is only later that Detective Brooks finds out that his daughter is safe at home. He couldn't talk, he just opened his arms and 
And I walked into them and he never said a word. I could see his eyes. I mean, they were, you could see pain reflected in them and so forth. By 11 p.m., the fire is under control. Firefighters make their way through the shambled ruins. There are over 100 bodies stacked by the entranceway to the Broadway Lounge, and many more in the corridor leading to the main dining room. Firefighter Charles Kenny Sr. finds singer Dottie Miles under a pile of corpses. Her face and hands are burned and black, but she is still alive. Tommy Sheehan is alive too, protected by the bodies that covered him when he fell. And somebody grabbed me and said, you better go to the hospital. You're all burnt. And the next thing I knew, paramedics must have picked me up and brought me to Boston City Hospital. Firefighters find many more bodies in the main floor supper club. On the VIP terrace, cowboy star Buck Jones barely clings to life. In the Melody Lounge in the basement, corpses on the stairs are heaped two and three high. The emergency fire door that could have taken them to safety is double bolted shut. Rather than having someone sneak out without paying a bill, some of the doors were bolted, uh, others were locked. Uh, the only exit that most people knew was the way they came in. One survivor is Iria Finn. Somehow uh, it's confusing after that, but I know I, somebody fireman pulled me out and I'm sitting there with no shoes on and no coat or anything and, and then a fireman came there and got me and took me to my girlfriend's house and I could hear the sirens all night. Miraculously, singer Dottie Miles survives despite burns to over 50% of her body. In the days that follow, the number of dead grows with every headline. The final total is 492. The youngest victim is 15. Investigations into the cause of the Coconut Grove fire by state and county district attorneys run concurrently with a public inquest. For a time, Busboy Stanley Tomaszewski shoulders the blame for starting the fire. In fact, by coincidence, the fire is already lurking behind the wall of the Melody Lounge when the busboy strikes his match. He was, from my point of view, uh, the major victim of the Coconut Grove fire because he lived under the mantle of having been called murderer and of having actually started the Coconut Grove fire. In point of fact, and this was later determined to be the case, what actually started the fire was a big short circuit in, a, in, a, uh, in an overfuse line behind the false wall. Charles Kenny Jr. attributes the fire's unusual speed to an air conditioner in the Melody Lounge fueled not by Freon as first thought, but by a much more volatile substance, methyl chloride. The whole catastrophe happened in somewhere between eight and 10 minutes. In essence, the accelerant, the initial accelerant that blew that fire to glory right away was methyl chloride escaping from that condenser compressor. Owner Barney Walansky is found guilty and sentenced to 12 to 15 years for manslaughter and conspiracy to violate building laws. After serving two and a half years, he is pardoned for ill health and dies a few months later. A Boston Fire Department report makes several recommendations, including the use of sprinkler systems in public places, clearly marked exit doors, and more than one avenue of escape. The report sparks changes to antiquated fire regulations across the United States and Canada. Those who survive the blazing destruction of the Coconut Grove 
are left with memories that will never fade away. Although he and my mother owned three and more homes in succession, all had fireplaces. My father would never let a fire be lit. Not even in the winter, not at holiday time, Christmas or whatever, he never allowed a fire. So uh, it, uh, it did impact him quite a, quite a great deal. I still don't know, to be truthful, how I ever got out. That, that, that's a puzzle to me. I don't know how I got out of it. Only God knows. All I can say is the man above was with me all the time. He helped me more or less to get out that building. I thank God that I uh, was able to come out and live another day and raise eight children and 27 grandchildren. <laughs> so I was put on this earth for something or I kept on this earth. I think I appreciated everything a little more fully knowing that I might, might not have ever been. So I'm very grateful that it wasn't my time. I didn't go. God or the hand of providence stopped me from going.